ну, Гитлер. But the Smirsch unit was worried that another brigade would take the bodies and steal the credit. So the two corpses were bundled into ammunition crates and spirited away. The corpses from the bunker garden were brought to this clinic in Buch on the outskirts of Berlin. Once an asylum for the insane, but by then a pathology lab. It was here that the autopsies were done on the bodies believed to be Hitler and Brown on May the 8th, VE Day, by a team of five forensic scientists of the Red Army. The male, they concluded, had died from cyanide poisoning. There was no mention of a bullet wound, only that part of the skull was missing. This was at odds with intelligence reports that Hitler had both taken poison and shot himself. The autopsy also found that the male corpse had only one testicle, a claim that cannot be verified as Hitler never allowed even his personal doctors to examine him thoroughly. On the corpse believed to be Brown's, they reported signs of shrapnel wounds to the chest, Yet no eyewitness had said she'd been wounded at all. So why the inconsistencies? Professor Norman Stone is the only historian to have studied the files of Operation Myth, which include the autopsy. In the first place, it's a bit sloppy. They're in a hurry. It's the E night. Uh, the second thing is that I suspect they were being leaned on by somebody simply to say he shot, he didn't shoot himself like a uh, man of guts, he munched on poison and that he'd killed his wife first of all. It sounds like good propaganda and I suspect they were leaned on. I mean, doctors in the Stalin system were leaned on. We can demonstrate it in other cases. The forensic team did at least acknowledge that the bodies were so damaged they could only be identified with certainty through their teeth. Smersch officers now scoured Berlin for Hitler's dentists. It was no easy task in a city in chaos from which half the population was trying to escape. But they did find Kater Heusemann, a dental assistant who had worked on the bridges for Hitler's teeth. She was ordered to make a drawing of his dental works from memory. Her sketch almost exactly matched the teeth from the charred body in the bunker garden. Smash was convinced and planned a major presentation to Stalin. Along with the confirmation of Hitler's death, Smash presented Stalin with a wealth of trophies plundered from Hitler's apartments in the Chancellery. A tapestry that has been locked away for 50 years of Hitler standing before a Nazi Europe. A walking stick celebrating the annexation of Austria. And even a sketchbook of Hitler's simple drawings dating from 1910 to 1921. This too has never been put on public display. Whether or not Stalin believed the reports of Hitler's death, he certainly did not share them with his Western allies. At the Potsdam conference in July, he told President Truman that Hitler had not been found and was assumed to be in hiding in the West. For many years, it has been claimed that Stalin was orchestrating a deliberate disinformation campaign. I suspect myself that the reason is much more simple, that they knew that the autopsy they'd made was not altogether right, and that if they had to deliver this bag of bones to the Allies, then there would be a certain amount of discredit to the Soviet Union out of it. I think that's much more likely. After Potsdam, it was the Allies' turn to be embarrassed. Hitler was seen everywhere, from a farm in Denmark to the Pampas in Argentina. 
the chief of British counterintelligence in Germany, Dick White, resolved to scotch the rumours. He had actually been told by the Russians in Berlin about Hitler's death. So he was astonished when, uh, sometime later, uh, they went uh, into reverse and even uh, accused the British, how seriously I don't know, but actually uh, accused the British of keeping Hitler alive in the British zone for future use against them. And this was uh, an astonishing fault for us, and Dick White uh, told me that he had decided to settle the matter, that one couldn't go on like this. He told me this in September, four months after uh, it had all been apparently uh, clear. And he said he was going to have a, an inquiry, and he asked if I would undertake it. Major Trevor Roper travelled through the wreckage of Germany, searching for people who'd escaped the bunker. Some he traced back to their homes. Others he found in prisoner of war camps. Within eight weeks, he'd completed his mission. His report chronicled the last ten days in the Berlin bunker. And he had no doubts what had happened to Hitler. I reported that he was dead, uh, that his body had been partially at least burned, that it had been buried probably in a shell hole in the garden of the Chancery, uh, and uh, uh, it, as far as I knew, had not been, at that time, had not been uh, dug up. But it had been buried, he was dead, and there was no question of his having escaped. But in Moscow, they were now doubting their own intelligence reports. It wasn't just the autopsy that raised suspicion. The interrogations, too, were discovered to have been less than thorough. There were some very remarkable, conflicting statements. Uh, some people said that he'd killed himself on the 29th, other people said he'd been on the 30th. There was an extraordinary story that somebody had shot the corpse. People looked at uh, the burning of the bodies from different angles and pronounced that it had happened in different places in the Rice Council like Garden, this sort of thing. So there were all sorts of weak spots in the original investigation. Soviet nerves might have been calmed had they been able to re-examine the body. But Hitler's body never reached Moscow. After the autopsies here in Buch, Hitler's and Eva Braun's remains had been taken out of Berlin by the Smersh unit as it moved west with the Third Shock Army. And each time they stopped for the night, they hid the bodies from prying eyes by burying them, often in nearby woods. At one point, the corpses were unearthed from their temporary graves by other Soviet soldiers digging for buried treasure. The Smersh unit returned to find the bones strewn over the undergrowth. They packed them back into their boxes and continued their journey. The bodies were finally laid to rest here in Klausener Street in Magdeburg, behind the house at number 36, where Smersch had its East German headquarters. For 25 years, Hitler and Eva Braun lay buried under this puddle, in a yard that now belongs to a firm dealing in waste disposal. You see, um, uh, to transport uh, the bodies to Soviet Union, then um, it would be known that the bodies are in the Soviet Union, then we will be then uh, facing the demands from foreign countries, show the bodies where they are, etc., etc. So these sort of inquiries politically were not necessary for us. And then we would be attaching too much importance to what remains from the bodies. The doubts raised by the original investigation might have passed without comment, but for a power struggle within the Lubyanka, headquarters of Soviet intelligence. By late 1945,